never given a presentation on a moving boat, so <laughs> pardon me. I typically give this presentation to adults, so that I'm going to get through some materials here that I think hopefully works for every every level. My goal is that you come away understanding a little bit about streams, streams in Pennsylvania, how we've modified streams in Pennsylvania, and so that you go out and you can look at things with a different eye and better understanding of the, of the environment. So my name is Brian Amon. I'm a landscape architect, and I'm going to show an example project that we did in, in both Lancaster County and one we did down in Lewisburg. So um, if you've ever visited Huffnagel Park in Lewisburg, this is a picture of what it, what it used to look like. We had a channelized stream. We had fill for about the last 250 years that channelized this stream uh, in an unnatural situation downtown. And people's residents' top priorities when we redid the park plan was how can we make this look like a more aesthetic stream corridor? You know, can we get rid of the rocks? It's not a very attractive feature. The kids can't use the stream. How, how can we enhance this? And this was the existing condition that people wanted to improve. And you can see small children, it was nearly impossible to get to the stream. When you got down there, you had wire, mesh, and other things that made it an unsafe situation for kids to even be in the stream. So we stepped back and took a watershed assessment look on the stream, and our goal was restoration. And I don't know if you've ever restored an old car or a historic house. The key to restoration is going back in time and understanding how you've changed and how you've modified that stream corridor. So, most people think historically before Europeans and settlers came to the United States and to Pennsylvania, our streams mostly looked like this. They were braided meandered channels. The water basically covered the entire floodplain. Now when European settlers came here, they came here to farm and to timber, and this didn't really work with their, their view of land and how it's used. So they often straighten the stream to, to match their, their land ownership and constricted the stream and often farmed that floodplain. So we did a lot of modifications to the stream. Here's an example in Lewisburg where if you've ever been to the farmer's market, the farmer's market's here. In 1864, the stream meandered through that area and then we changed it to this kind of you know, trapezoidal figure. And they did it so they could build the fairground. It's called Fairground Road, and they actually built a horse racing track there. So it completely changed the stream location where it occurred. We did the same thing on St. Mary Street Park. Again, the stream meandered here. It was changed and straightened to the southern side of the park. So we've shifted it around based on what we wanted to do with the land. Here they probably farmed it or grazed it uh, for, for use over time. And here's the stream as it goes through town. And when I first saw this, I thought, well, this is just a braided stream. You know, there's not just one channel, there's two channels. Later I found out that this was this was the stream, and this was the head race and the tail race for Durr's mill. He had a he had a mill here that would cut timber from the lumber area that floated down the West Branch Susquehanna River. So we've really changed and modified streams over time, and that's our park space now that we're, we're, we're redesigning. And this got us asking, how, how many times were there, how many mills were there in the state of Pennsylvania? And here's just some of the dots showing where farm mills were located. So they were basically everywhere. Where one flat water stopped, you had another dam, and the next farmer upstream had another mill. And these were really basic structures. <laughs> you build a you build a little dam and you could power a mill and you could do all these things, grist mills, saw mills being the primary use. So if you're a farmer, you can build a mill, you have a stream running through your property, you build a mill, you can grind your grain and sell it for a higher price versus just selling the raw grain. Or in the off season, you can cut timber and mill timber. So it was a great way to raise money. And so these things were everywhere. But what we're doing, we're, we're living with the, uh, the remnants of all those mill dams. 
So if you've ever spent, how many have spent time along streams, fishing or doing other things? Raise a hand, kids. Nice. Have you ever seen banks that are vertical like this? It's really hard to get into the stream, right? You're standing up here, you tumble in, you fall. It just looks like dirt, right? This is telling a 250 year story here. Just dirt. Dirt tells you a story because it tends to form layers over time. And this really doesn't have any layers. And you'll see this really dark layer down here. That was the original topsoil location. The farmer built a dam, flooded everything behind it, and there's three, three and a half feet of sediment that filled in behind that stream. So that has impact on our water quality today because we want clean water for fish and other things that live there, right? And we, we find this in other places. This is Lewisburg. Here's that, here's that topsoil location. There's three and a half feet of sediment. If I was the person living in that house, I'm looking at this and saying, this is causing my house to flood more often because all of that capacity of that floodplain is taken up by what we call legacy sediments. Nope, that person didn't do this. A farmer 200 years ago did this. So what do we do about this to, to restore the stream? So here's some examples of work down in Lancaster County. And there's the original soil layer. This is four feet of sediment on top of that. They literally took a bulldozer in the floodplain and removed it all. You can see they planted a lot of trees. Those trees weren't going to hold that back. And every time there was a storm event, tons of sediment would get into our stream, get into the Susquehanna River, get into the Chesapeake Bay system. So here was one solution that they said, let's try something different. They literally removed all this sediment and it was beautiful soil. So contractors bought it, construction companies bought it. They actually paid for a quarter of the budget by having people buy the dirt that was in the floodplain. So this is what it looked like during construction. And this is what it looked like after construction. You can see the limits of the soil removal, about 100 yards across this. What was really cool about this project is plant people came in and found rare and endangered plant species growing here. And they said, did you do a salvage operation to put those plants here? Did you see those from rare and endangered plant species? And we didn't. Our best guess is that it came you had dormant seed living in that soil bed from 150 years ago. And we brought it to the top, the sunlight, the water, and it germinated. So pretty fantastic regeneration of that environment. Here's another example in Lidditz, where I think you've all seen these big grass detention basins, stormwater, where it runs off the parking lot and is held here and discharged slowly. In lieu of that, this company was able to restore the floodplain instead of building these detention facilities, which ecologically is much better for the environment than these grassland detention basins. Lower maintenance, better for wildlife, better for habitat, better for water quality. One other situation where legacy sediments impacts our streams today is that how many of you how many of you fish again? Let's see a raise of hand. What kind of fishing do you do? What, what do you fish for? Crappie. Anybody else? Do you know what kind of fish you go out here? Trout and crappie, bluegill and crappie, what kind of waters do they like to swim in? Fresh water. Fresh water. Cold or hot? Warmer water. Uh, no, warmer water. Warmer. Trout, on the other hand, where do trout like to swim? Sir? Um, in fresh water. Fresh water and warm or cold? Okay. Trout like cold water. Okay. Oh, 
50-50. So people talk about trout streams, and they're often in limestones where there's water flowing into the stream. Historically, we had all this water under pressure, and it was feeding those streams. The legacy sediments came in and created You'll be walking along a stream bed in a degraded landscape, and the bottom will be more mud than it will be gravel, right? And that's literally cutting off the groundwater from entering that stream. So here's an example where we got rid of that legacy sediment and created deep water pockets in the stream. Little deep water pockets that got into the original cobble location and released all this groundwater into the stream this stream before and after construction reduced in temperature 29 degrees Fahrenheit because we were able to plug in to the groundwater versus just surface water. You know, that mud puddle sitting on, on the road is, gets really warm really fast. That's kind of what our streams are doing today because they're cut off from their historic connection with underwater groundwater. Fantastic, this little stream now supports trout that it didn't previously. So all these things you can learn by tweaking things in the environment and doing different things to restore the habitat. So this brings us, this is some examples of restored streams. So you don't have vertical banks, you have a connected floodplain. When the flood water comes up, it spreads out and dissipates. You don't have erosion and you have better cobbles and habitat in the stream for, for aquatic life. You know, these are some of, you know, just think if you're an amphibian, you're a turtle, that'd be perfect place for you to live, right? And this is a floodplain. This is a wetland in the floodplain that actually treats highway runoff, so very functional. This was owned by a township. It was difficult for them to do the mowing for this. This was lawn before we converted this. Uh, this was built in 1997, you know, 20, 25 years ago. 20, five years ago, so it takes a while for these things to become mature. So coming back to Lewisburg, what we wanted to do was get rid of that ugly rock and riprap, and we had to do the model to see, was that possible? The bridges still have really fast water flowing through them, but we were able to slow down the flow. Huffnagel Park was named after uh, Officer Huffnagel who died in the 1972 flood. So 50 years ago and a week ago, he was in this neighborhood rescuing people during the flood and he died in the process. So it's named in memorial to him and that is what killed him. He got caught in that torrent of water in the 1972 flood and couldn't get out. So what we wanted to do was create a more uh, safer situation with the flooding, but also slow down that flooding flow and create a more natural stream. So here's some examples, and by expanding the floodplain, we we're also able to limit the, the extent of flooding in the neighborhood. So here's some before and after photos. That was the existing riprap and the vertical walls, and that's what it looks like today vertical walls again in the St. Louis Street Bridge and that's what it looks like today with an accessible floodplain the kids can walk down there and play vertical walls uh, expanded floodplain and this is probably the worst part of it and that's what it looks like today so it's like what we can do to restore the stream even in a very narrow urban area in downtown and all this wildlife habitat, all these pollinators, we got rid of turf grass and rock, and we, we created habitat. More importantly, uh, we created a place for kids to play in the stream. We created a Kidsburg Nature Playground as part of that. Uh, we have loose parts that we, we're, we're raising money to have a bin that they, they're available. Anytime the kids come out, they have access to these basic things, rope and tarp, and natural materials, the play is unique every time that they come out to the site. They can create their own play. This kid created this, you know, he's a future architect. He, he, it was a really hot day, he, he you know, produced this. Um, very proud of his work. Uh, some of the elements of the nature play. Uh, nice gathering place for parents too in the, in the, uh, in the neighborhood. 
and the rock, the log slide. But more important, I grew up playing in this creek. I, I, I didn't grow up in town, so I had to make my own fun. And this is kind of a remnant to, to me in my childhood. This is how we played as kids. And I think this is missing in childhood today with a traditional park. You go and you play on recycled rubber, and you play on steel, and you play on plastic. And it's like there's, there's you, it's an effort to get kids out of the house and into nature. And then when you get them there, they're, they're, you're, you're playing on recycled tires. I, I never understood that. So my goal was to really create an accessible stream that wasn't safe to be in before. Uh, it, this just, this was the goal, to get kids playing in the stream, playing in the mud, you know, hunting frogs, having a good time. I think this generation coming up, you know, you guys are going to have to figure how to live on this planet without destroying it. And if kids don't have a relationship with nature, why are they going to care about it? And you hear statistics about eight hours a day of screen time from your average, your average kid. These are probably not typical kids, right? So thank you for being here today. But you know, we have to raise awareness of these bigger picture issues and just have kids have a, mean, a meaningful relationship with nature. And so I'm really glad you're here today because this is, this is probably the most important thing that you know, we need to do for the next generation. So some other opportunities, many of you are from the greater Williamsport area, is that correct? So here's some things, here's some things in your area I've been involved with Robert Porter Allen Natural Area and the Sylvandale Farm and just some other things that uh, I think you should be aware of. One of the things is restoring versus rewilding. You know, historically we've done all this work with heavy equipment, all that heavy equipment that was used to create that screen corridor in, in Lewisburg. There's other options for that. And that's why I brought my star of the presentation here today is Castor Canadensis. Don't touch them. But if, sorry, I touched you before. But the, the beaver is a really a key, key component to what I think is the future of stream restoration. Uh, if you've never seen the video of how wolves change rivers, this idea of reintroducing keystone species, it's a five minute video. It's one of the most fascinating things you'll ever see is when they reintroduced wolves to Yellowstone, how it changed the ecosystem, how it changed the streams. They hunted the elk, and the elk quits hanging out in the stream corridors and degrading the stream corridors, moved up to the edge of the woods where they wouldn't as easily be hunted by the wolf pack, and it revitalized the streams. The willows came back, the beavers came back, the songbirds come back, the insects, the amphibians, they all came back just by reintroducing the wolves. So it's a fantastic story. And nobody's talking about reintroducing wolves in Pennsylvania, but we have our own keystone species, the beaver, the Castor canadensis, and what they do to ecosystems. When they come in, they can completely change streams from channelized to one that spreads out over the whole floodplain. Now, you don't want them in your backyard. But there's places in Pennsylvania where they would really be an asset to help mitigate flooding, to improve biodiversity, to just help us restore the thousands and thousands of miles of degraded streams that we have. So you can even engage student projects are doing this across the country where they build BDAs, beaver dam analogs that give them a foothold into small headwater streams because they're kind of sitting ducks. They're big, they're fat, they're you know, wolf or fox coyote would just love to eat this guy. So they're often at risk until they have their own established impoundment where they're safe. So students are going out and building these things across the country to reintroduce beavers, beaver dam analogs. And this is some of the examples of what they do. They come into a system, channelize stream, dam it up and just spread that water out, diversifies habitat, think of migratory birds and ducks, uh, creates that kind of environment and uh, just completely changes. Here's a partnership between humans and beavers where they've removed a levee 
and it went from that to this again biodiversity uh, enhancing the, the wildlife habitat value improving water quality and so the many benefits of beaver benefits wetland restoration biodiversity water quality sediment capture pollutant mitigation groundwater recharge drought mitigation flood mitigation and people go to see them so ecotourism and visitors so just in 17 years they noted all these changes Europe and England the UK has really embraced this and they quantified all the benefits doubled the size of the brown trout uh, brought back bat brought back 10, 17 species of insects brought back birds that hadn't been in that environment for decades it's amazing what what beavers can help trigger as far as ecological restoration. And this is the Robert Porter Allen and the Sildadel Farm. How many of you have been there? Nobody, this is great. So it's on Sildadel Road, just east of the Southside Recreational Park. You can actually access it from there. But this is the signature wetland. This is why we acquired the land for conservation was to restore this wetland that was being degraded by the farmer. Uh, here's the wetland, here's Sylvandale Road. This is the Southside Rec Park and you can access the trail system right here. Or you can park at the Sylvandale Road farmhouse and walk back in. Beautiful piece of property and we're just in the beginning processes of restoring the habitat. There's beaver here. We're hoping they migrate into the main part of the wetland and start building the terraces of wetlands. And we want to quantify the changes that will occur over time, the ecological changes. And we're working with the Game Commission. We're working with uh, the state on their tree re reforestation program. There's a kestrel that was nesting. We have kestrels nesting. And we're thinking about how to creatively reuse the barn and the farmhouse structures. So outdoor programming, environmental center, and outdoor preschool. Uh, we're, we're looking for ways to creatively reuse these structures and we're looking for partnerships. So if nothing else, visit the site with your kids, see it today. We're hoping in 15, 20 years, 40 years when they're older, they'll see a drastic difference between what it is today versus what it will be in the future as far as habitat value. It's gone from traditional farming, we have it seeded in grasses right now and it'll evolve and change over time. Also, I'm, I'm advocating something called the Ridge Trail which would reutilize you know, the lands up on the ridge here that would, public lands, it's water authority lands, it's state lands that link all the communities of the West Branch Susquehanna River from Muncie into the Greater Williamsport area into the Pine Creek Rail Trail on Jersey Shore the whole way to Lock Haven. 50 miles of just repurposing and reusing the gravel road and the trail network up on the ridge over our heads here just to create an, an enhanced uh, recreational opportunity. So here's the loop trail that you could do out of Williamsport. The Silvendale Farm is right here connect up to the ridge, go here. You can have an all day adventure on a bicycle that would be you know, 18 or 26 miles depending on the loop you made and just have an all day fun experience with your family or as recreation or outdoor adventure for you. But just repurposing and reusing what's already there. It's, it's our land, it's authority land, it's state land and to repurpose that and reuse it. And that's some of the beauty you see up on the ridge line, that 50 mile corridor from Muncie to, to Lock Haven. So here's some of the reference materials that I suggest for you know this, this kind of information. Uh, more adult reading books, but we have Support Your Local Bookstore, Autos. Uh, we have some great assortment here of environmental education books, some information on beavers that never existed when we were kids and a whole other thing. Do you want to say anything? So, again, there's a lot of information, a lot of reading material here for, for anybody to learn more about this. But um, I'm really excited about both that traditional form of stream restoration, but also this rewilding opportunities. And I think of the future for, for uh, I think of the future for the kids that 
you know, you can be a civil engineer, you can be an ecologist, or you can also study beavers and know how to manage them and control them, and then you can be part of the stream restoration projects in the future. So.